make sure that everyone has time to, to finish their presentation. So, and so because we have three medical students, I'm gonna kinda, just to warn everyone, I'm gonna kinda keep track of time and help them stay on track, because I always feel bad for the last medical student when everyone's really sick of it and they have to rush through, so. We're starting, to start off, we have Chris Bowen speaking to us. He's from Utah, did uh, undergraduate at Utah State University, and then he's been here for medical school. He actually took some time off to, during medical school, he took a year to get a master's degree in biomedical engineering. And today he's presenting bench to bedside ocular drug delivery. Okay. Well, I'm Chris, and I'm really excited to be here um, and talking about bench to bedside and ocular drug delivery research. Um, the cool thing about the University of Utah is it's really like a hub. Uh, it's a it's a ground in which people can come together and create ideas. Um, and in 2011, this was the uh, newspaper title that we were number one again um, for startup companies creating lots of jobs and a lot of support to the economy. And so I was thinking, what is it that is unique about the University of Utah that allows for this? And I think it's this combination of, and collaboration between engineering and business, everybody working together. Um, the cool thing about this is that a lot of you in this room are, are part of this, are either inventors or entrepreneurs. Um, just within the Moran, we have people working on anti-infective needles. We have people that have, are working on uh, intraocular lenses with the continuous drug delivery, um, as well as uh, retinal surgery robots. That's pretty much the next Da Vinci, but for retinal surgery. <coughs> and it's really, really cool to see all this innovation happening. Um, the cool thing is, is each one has to go through this, uh, the FDA regulatory pathway. But usually the rate limiting step up here is the user need. Um, and that is, well, what is the problem? What, what needs to happen? Um, so it's the surgeon or the clinician that says, well, I really wish we had this scope that did this a little differently, or I wish we had this tool that could work this way. The engineer or the business person usually doesn't have the, the idea of, well, what's actually wrong that needs to be fixed, and they're really eager to, to fix. Um, so truly you are, and the clinicians are the, the lifeblood of bioinnovation. Um, and a little plug for students, when they come up and innovate, they really, really appreciate being mentored by you guys. So today I get to talk about uh, a project that we're work working on with Dr. Rorosco. Um, and it began uh, last year when I was taking a biocompatibility class from Dr. Check and the NIH grant, and I wanted to make it something that actually was real research instead of just homework. And so I called around, and Dr. Rorosco was super willing to let me work with her and her project. So HiSTEM is a, a polymer that's a drug delivery platform and it's been in license uh, J Therapeutics, which Dr. Roscoe founded. And that allows for uh, this project that we've been working on. So it began with a need. Um, so what is the biocompatibility of this uh, polymer specifically? And what's the degradation rate? Um, this drug polymer has been used in a number of locations in the body um, but not specifically in the eye, and so that's the, the journey that's been going on. The purpose is for continuous drug release for a variety of ocular pathologies. HiSTEM is really cool. What it is is it's a polyglycol, and it's been cross-linked with uh, a thiolated hyaluronic acid. And all those things are extremely biocompatibility friendly, at least their components are. And so when you combine them, you have a very unique um, robust platform for de delivering uh, proteins and small molecules. Um, it can come as either a liquid, an injectable or a film. It was a lot of variety in which it can be used um, in the ocular world. If we compare it to some of the current drug delivery platforms, uh, such as DOGA, which is used in nanomedicine, um, antibi antibiotic delivery, um, just a bunch of different things. Very similar in, in that it has biocompatibility 
that's been shown throughout the rest of the body. But one of the product problems is, is that when it degrades, and then it's, if you have a protein that you're trying to deliver, it will denature it or change its structure. And so it's, it's, not, it's not very friendly in that way, as well as it has pro-inflammatory markers or uh, byproducts. So hydrogen is, is really advantageous in that way because it's pH neutral and it has no inflammatory byproducts. Um, research that's been done on this, um, not in the eye, has, been, has shown that it prevents post-surgical lesions, as well as preventing scarring and a lot of other wound issues. Additionally, it's been shown to deliver proteins in small molecules such as VEGF, FGF, sinitinib, as well as a host of other things throughout for systemic use. It's also being used in the veterinary world for wound healing, um, marketed by and Centrix here in Salt Lake City called uh, Remend. And also in Europe, it's being used for stem cell delivery. So it has this large capability for use. So the question is, is where would we want to use this in the eye? The cornea, corneal surface pathologies for retinal pathologies, um, such as AMD, glaucoma. So one of our questions was the degradation rate. So how can we determine how fast it's going to break down? Because remember, it's, it's polyethylene glycol and it's linked to hyaluronic acid. And that hyaluronic acid can be broken down um, easily by a host, the, the, the primary enzyme um, hyaluronic acid. And that enzyme family has six isotypes. Um, the last three are usually associated with so the body. So the first three isotypes are the ones that would be most likely in the eye. So this is a project that we're just starting now. And our plan is to do immunohistochemistry um, to look for where exactly this, uh, which isotype is found in. And then we'll run ELISAs. We currently have human, monkey, and rabbit um, to determine the concentration. So two weeks ago, just before I started this rotation, we ran our and a quick preview, we found that in human tears, I should say Barbara's human tears, <laughs> um, we found um, hyaluronidase, the enzyme that breaks it down, isotype 1, in the tears, the monkey aqueous, and vitreous. I think we diluted it a little too much and it wasn't found in, in some of the others because the lower limits was about two and a half uh, nanometers, or nanograms, excuse me. So our next step is once we finish this, we'll have all of our healthy eyes, and then we'll compare it to the diseased eyes. Um, and the reason why is because studies have shown that when an individual is sick or has different diseases such as scleroderma or rheumatological diseases, they have an upregulation of um, hyaluronidase. And so we want to know if we're going to deliver this drug and it has hyaluronic acid in it, if they're sick, we might change the dosage and how much we actually give because the enzyme that breaks it down is going to be either upregulated or downregulated. So that's our, our next step. Um, so once we finish that and go on to uh, biocompatibility testing as well with the ISO 10993, we will go on refining the drug release, optimizing that film shape for the different needs going to go in the eye, uh, sterilization protocols, and then additional verification uh, studies in both animals and humans. And I'm really excited to be able to work with uh, Dr. Roscoe. It's been a really fun experience so far, as well as uh, Dr. Lee, uh, and a, one of my lab uh, mentors. Any questions? Yeah. Well, not so much a question as a comment. I think this work is very exciting. I think drug delivery, especially in the eye and all segments of the eye, is an exciting place to be. One thing that, that hasn't been mentioned here that I don't know if it's going to be under the business card or not is regulatory. And I think the biggest hurdle right now to get uh, medications that are going to be released into the eye is the FDA. And we run into this constantly with, with other issues. Uh, more than 15 years ago, somebody called Ocula put together a biodegradable polymer which could put both an antibiotic and a steroid in and shoot it in the eye at the end of the cataract surgery and it wouldn't do this to people. But
So this is a very very difficult issue. But fortunately, the remnants of the company were bought by Allergan, and this is now Hashibet, which is a little supply chain for the two refrigerators now, so we lose their owners. But the issues in terms of getting this approved by the FDA are very expensive. And same thing, intraocular lenses now. People have been putting intraocular lenses in antibiotics and showing that they are lead antibiotics for about a decade and a half. And again, the issues of getting that approved by the FDA uh, is a tremendous cost barrier on this, and that's why this is not something that's being done. I mean, ideally, when you're looking at drug delivery, what would be better than an intraocular lens to start to fill up in an antibiotic and put some care to put it in the eye? You don't have to worry about compliance. You don't have to worry about expensive people using the drops or anything.